Hey everybody, Brendan Fitzgerald here in Las Vegas. Hope you're doing well wherever you are. Happy to have you for this live Q&A with Michael Chandler and Caitlin Chukagian. Must mention that Megan O'Levy, she's stuck in an airport somewhere, folks. Haven't we all been there? And, you know, we're excited to be back in front of a full house, 17,000 strong in Houston. But of course, when you take the show back out on the road, there are some drawbacks. So Megan O'Levy on assignment. Don't worry, she'll be in Houston this weekend. But for now, you got to put up with me. You also get to put up with the former flyweight title challenger, Caitlin Chukagian, and of course, the headliner for UFC 262, Michael Chandler. So let's bring our two athletes on because that's who you really want to talk to on this. Uh, Michael Chandler and Caitlin on location in Houston. Michael, you're headlining, but ladies first. Caitlin, how are you doing this evening? I'm great. Um, I just got here this afternoon, had like a nice uh, five-hour flight from New York, but uh, I'm happy to be here. Right. There you go. Show on the road. So it's a bit different now, right? But it's not uh, silent crowds in the apex coming up. Michael, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, man. Got here yesterday and uh, the team is here. We are getting ready to put on a great show on Saturday night. Can't wait. Man, we can't wait to see it all. And of course, there's going to be a lot of fans in the house that can't wait to see it all. So Michael, I'll start with you. The anticipation. What is it with with the crowd. We all watched what happened in Jacksonville. Now it's your turn. What are you thinking? Yeah, that's great. I mean, obviously, after a year of essentially no fans whatsoever, my last fight in Abu Dhabi, there was a couple thousand fans. You could you could you could feel it, but it's not nothing like a packed arena. Uh, and even just a couple weeks ago, watching the Jacksonville card, even on TV, you could hear and feel the energy that the crowd brings to an arena. And uh as we descend upon Houston, the Toyota Center, man, 20, almost 20,000 people strong, a year of, of MMA-starved fans not getting what they want, which is live action. Extremely excited, extremely excited to be on this awesome card, top to bottom. We're going to blow the roof off the Toyota Center on Saturday night. Fans, if you guys want to submit a question, you can do so. Just look for the uh, the box in the top right. Ask a question. Caitlin, same question to you, though, because uh, obviously you want to be back in front of a full house, and you will uh, be on that main card as well. Yeah, I mean, the last time I fought in front of a crowd was here at Toyota Center. So it, it kind of came around full circle. You know, it, it was crazy over the past year. I, I was pretty active. I fought like three times during without a crowd. And, um, you know, I kind of just came to terms. I'm like, you know, you know, I'm getting a little bit older. Like I might never fight in front of a crowd again. Like that's that's pretty realistic. And um, I was okay with that. I kind of liked not fighting in front of a crowd for certain reasons. Like I liked hearing my coaches, hearing my opponents coaches and everything but as soon as they said that um you know i was going to be on this card and then they said there was going to be crowd, uh fans there it, it definitely made me realize how much i appreciate that and how excited right. i am for that uh michael you know obviously your experience in the ufc is not long but you have plenty of fight game experience when you came to the ufc what did you expect it would take to find yourself in a title fight Man, uh, you never know. I mean, I, I think the older I get, the more I realize that I need to live by the words, expect the unexpected, have no expectations. The, the best kind of expectations is having no expectations. When I got into the, when I signed with the UFC, I didn't know if it was going to take 10 fights, five fights, or here in my second fight, honestly. Um, all I knew is I wanted to sign. I wanted to come put my best foot forward and uh, get to work right away. I showed up with my work boots on. I wanted to kick down the door to the lightweight party. And uh, that's what I did on January 23rd, and that's now what I get to do on May 15th. So I um, had no idea it would happen this fast, but I sure am glad it's happened this fast. And once we win the title, then I'm going to defend the belt as many times as I possibly can in a very short period of time. Caitlin, for you, one year ago, you mentioned you fought in Houston. That was against Valentina. So where does a win like uh, like this coming up this weekend against Ada Ujo put you in the division? Because you still want to be and have been fighting right at the top and you're coming off a big win. Yeah, I'm kind of in a, an interesting position, you know, in this, uh, the flyweight division, you know, I've been number one, number two for probably like since the division opened. Um, you know, I, I don't think I'm great for the division because people don't want to... Uh, when I'm not going to get the title shot right now, there's other girls that are contending that haven't fought for the title yet. So I understand that, but then some of the girls won't want to fight me because they don't want to risk losing and not getting that title shot. So I'm kind of in a, a tricky situation. I've, I've been very active, but all, the reason why I've been active is because I've been taking last minute fights. Like 
girls pull out and then I'll take it. Um, you know, usually for like a number two position, you don't usually have to do that that often, but I want to stay active and fight as much as I can. And I realized the only way for me to get to earn another title shot is to just keep racking up wins. So if I, the more active I am, the more, you know, likely I am to get that opportunity right. again. So just keep saying yes. Keep yes. saying yes and keep piling up the wins, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Michael, back to you. Charles Oliveira. Uh, he certainly presents an interesting challenge. What does a win over him, where does that rank for you? Well, I think just the magnitude of the event, the fact that it's for the UFC title, which is the epitome of, of accomplishment inside mixed martial arts. Uh, you know, I've won world titles outside the UFC. I've, I've fought on big cards with legends like the late Kimbo Slice and Tito Ortiz and Ken Shamrock, Hoist Gracie, uh, that brought a lot of eyeballs. Um, but this is the biggest fight of my life because it's for the lightweight title, because it's in an A-packed arena, and because of what's at stake. Charles Oliveira is a consummate professional. He's been in the UFC for over a decade. Charles Oliveira has almost been in the UFC for as long as I've been fighting. So um, it's, uh, it's a great test. He's dangerous everywhere. Not only, not only does he have the most submission wins in the UFC history, but the way in which the amount of different variances and different ways that he has submitted people, I think it's like seven or eight different submissions of those 14. It's just absolutely bonkers. Um, so it's a dangerous fight. It's an exciting fight. So a win over him solidifies me as the number one guy. And then after that, we got Connor and Poirier fighting in July, who will, who one of them will emerge as the number one contender. I'll fight one of them by the end of the year. Yeah, certainly high stakes and, and a bright future, but obviously business to tend to this weekend. Caitlin, you, um, train at Henzo Gracie in New York city famed, uh, you know, jujitsu, of course, from John Donahart, a fan question here. They want to know what stories you have from training at that great Enzo Gracie Academy or with John Donaher? Uh, it's kind of funny, you know, until until he cornered me, I never really saw him outside of the gym. And I was like, I asked him one time, like, you do leave this gym, right? Like, because I'm here a lot and I don't see you. You see him when you walk in and when you leave. But um, a funny thing about him is if, like, if you don't know, like in between sessions, he just like curls up in a ball and lays on the side of on the mat and sleeps in between sessions mm -hmm. so sometimes people will come down and it's funny when like visitors come and they do a private with them they're like wait my private was supposed to be at four o'clock and we're like no your private's when he wakes up it's you, you know you don't know when he went to sleep yeah. so uh, it's a, i think a lot of people they think he's like super scary and intimidating and when they walk in they just see like this grown man crawled up in a ball sleeping in the <laughs> in the corner of the mat it's always funny seeing people's reactions there do you watch Billions? He was in an episode of Billions, wasn't he? he oh, was I didn't like, know that. Uh, oh, yeah. He was in an episode of Billions. He was Chuck Rhodes, like, you know, who was doing a private jujitsu lesson. I was watching that with my wife. I was like, that guy's a big deal. I was like, he's yeah. not that, you know, they're proving a point there that this guy takes lessons from John. Yeah, um, it's funny. When you go out to, like, eat with him, you know, at restaurants or anywhere, and then when he cornered me, that was the only time I saw him. I'm like, wait, you're not going to wear a rash guard because you have to wear the uniform. Uh huh. And he had it. And, like, the second we went back in the locker room, he, like, switched it off after. Right, right. <laughs> That's awesome. Speaking of training and world class training, Michael, uh, Sanford MMA down in Florida. Can't get better than that. What does it do to be in a room like that? You got Gilbert Burns, you got Usman that you've been with for a long time. And, you know, I'm leaving off so many names there. But what's it like in that gym? Man, I think, uh, I, you know, iron sharpens iron. It's an old adage that that combat sports is kind of built after. We have phenomenal leadership in Henry Hooped and Kami Barzini, Greg Jones. Um, so a ton of experience, a wealth of knowledge in the coaching department. But then when you think, man, as you said, Kamaru Usman won the UFC title while he was at San Sanford. Gilbert Burns challenged Kamaru Usman there. Luke Rockhold, Robbie Lawler, Logan Storley, who was a four-time wrestling All-American. So you have extremely, extremely well-versed and accomplished men in all the different disciplines of mixed martial arts. And our philosophy is simple. Keep Our, our, philo our philosophy is keep it simple, keep it devastating, we're going to be dangerous and we're going to be brilliant with the basics. Try to keep that culture of showing up on time, doing things right, operating with, with character, operating with integrity, and the team just keeps getting better and better and better. And we have to, at this point, turn, turn people away because so many people are wanting to come in and train with us. So every single day on the mats, people are getting after it extremely hard. And um, Gilbert's going to be out here this week. I worked a ton with him and, and his brother, uh, Herbert, who are both um, Brazilian, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts. So 
no matter who you're fighting, what style you're fighting, there is always a, a wealth of people there in groups to be able to get you prepared for these different fights that we go in. So confidence is, is sky high. And a lot of that has to do with being trained by and with everybody at Sanford. Yeah. Can't argue with the results. That's for sure. Um, Caitlin, back to you. Fan question. What's your biggest martial arts goal outside of the UFC? Um, I guess outside of the UFC would be, you know, I'm a brown belt in jujitsu, so and I've been a brown belt for a long time. So definitely a, a black belt would be would be my only other goal. Um, I've just trained martial arts my whole life. I mean, I started karate when I was four years old. So like for me, it doesn't it just is like a way of life. And I just see myself, even when I'm done fighting, you know, I might not spar as much or I might not do as many wrestling classes, but, um, but I definitely see myself training even, you know, when I'm way old and, you know, I just kind of want to do it for the rest of my life. I just, that's what I like about it. It's something that you can, you can do forever. Yeah. But definitely getting my black belt jujitsu would be like probably the only other goal besides the, the UFC belt. Right. But after the fighting days are done, you're just going to be in there no matter how old. And no matter how young the training partners are, you're going to keep going. Yeah, I'm probably going to be like the the crazy old lady on the mat that like the new fighters are like, oh, yeah, we know you used to fight, you know, and I'm going to be telling them what what they're doing wrong and everything. That's definitely yeah. me. It's good to have goals. That sounds like a fun one. Yeah. Um, Michael, here's a fan question for you. Uh, in your fight with Charles Oliveira coming up, right, grappling is going to be uh, something that fans look for. You're the wrestler. He's the jujitsu guy. What what role do you think grappling and your wrestling will have uh, to play in this fight? Uh, for for me, my wrestling background always has been very much anti jujitsu, more of an anti jujitsu style. I think uh, with my explosiveness, body body mechanics, body awareness, body positioning, and my ability to to pr- put pressure on my opponents, um, and then also have kind of that sixth sense when when I can feel my opponent underneath me shifting his hips, moving his legs, getting into pres- p- different positions where the threat of um, submissions may be. I've always kind of had a sixth sense in there just from mainly the fact that I got into the sport of mixed martial arts right away, started training with really high level guys and immediately started getting tapped out, choked out, arm getting ripped off. Um, so I learned by experience, I learned through the pain to start to build this sixth sense. Um, But really, for me, wrestling is always going to be my base. I'm going to get in his face very quickly. I'm going to put my hands on him, whether I'm whether I'm grappling or getting my hands locked, or whether I'm just throwing strikes, Um, and then just have more of an anti jujitsu thwarting of the BJJ style of uh, Charles Oliveira, and uh, hope for the best and keep the pace high and try to get my hand raised on Saturday night. How do you explain anti jujitsu? I mean, I think it's more just you know. If you look at the sport of mixed martial arts and you have striking and you have grappling, um, grappling being jujitsu and wrestling, there's there's really only those two, three, four different certain positions in general in mixed martial arts. Striking will take care of itself. You're on your feet. But when it comes to that grappling exchange, you're going to have him. You have Charles Oliveira trying to, to get to positions to get submissions. And for a guy like myself, I'm going to just get to positions to, side, to try to stay out of submissions to do damage. I'm more of a pressure heavy, get a guy into a position, hold the position, and then do damage with strikes. Whereas Charles Oliveira is more of a get to a position, do something slick, try to catch a slick submission kind of kind of guy. So we're, we are very much the yin and the yang of um, – the grappling exchanges, if you will. Right. He's more BJJ looking for submissions. I'm more positioned trying to look for damage. And then if I do get a submission, it's mainly just because I've done so much damage and the guy gives up and I'm able to get slip in a, an easy rear naked choke or a side choke or something like that. Right. That's uh, why it's such a great matchup that we can't wait to see. Uh, Caitlin, back to you and a fan question. A uh, fan says you're one of the pioneers of mixed martial arts for women. Who would you put on your Mount Rushmore of women's MMA? Um, I know being a like someone saying I'm a pioneer is supposed to be a compliment, but I'm right away. I'm like, oh my god, I'm old now. I, <laughs> I feel like pioneer gets thrown around a little too yeah, much. You're not, like, you're not old enough compliment. to be a pioneer in my eyes, but but um, I guess for was Mount Rushmore. There's four of them. Yeah, four. Okay. I mean, it's up so, to you. You're, you know, you can make the rules. Okay. We'll go for it. I think um, Gina Carano, uh, Ronda Rousey, Cyborg, and Misha Tate. 
You know, okay. I think that they're, you know, they kind of made the sport popular for women. I remember when I first started fighting and people would be like, oh, what do you do? I don't understand. I would like be like, have you ever heard of Ronda Rousey? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of her. I'm like, I do what she does. I'm like, okay. You know, yeah. so I definitely think they, that uh, they kind of earn the spots there. Yeah. They would ask you, do you train UFC? Yeah. Right. I'm like, you know when people fight in a cage? Yeah, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> that's the thing. Um, you fought at 135 as well a little bit, right? Yeah, when I first got signed, I always fought a uh, flyweight, and then they didn't have that for the right. women's in um in the UFC at the time. And um, when I got signed, I had the three fights at bantamweight, and then after that, they opened up the flyweight, and uh, then I moved down. Okay, would you ever consider going up to one thirty five? Only asking because Misha Tate is you know back in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely, I'm a pretty big 25 er um, you know, I'm five, nine, so I'm definitely, definitely can hold my own there. Um, you know, if I've even said to the matchmakers when I've gone through months where I'm like bug bugging them, I'm like, can you give me another fight? Can you give me another fight? I'm like, I'll fight at 135. If I see like a, a girl like pulls out of a fight or gets injured, you know, I'll definitely do that. I like to, you know, I train all the time and, you know, I, running out of time so i want to stay right. as active as possible and just fight as much as i can yeah well we'll see if you can fight one of those on your mount rushmore uh yeah. at some point um okay this is a question for both of you michael i'll start with you as a veteran of the fight game what advice do you have to your younger self oh for my younger self um i think number one you know when i got into the sport i i had fallen short in in my previous uh, career as, as a wrestler and I and I made a vow to myself okay Michael if you're going to get into mixed martial arts not only are you going to try to do it to the best of your ability but you're going to be a champion and you're going to believe in yourself but with that when I I won my first world title got ranked in the top three in the world 18 months after starting mixed martial arts so immediately I felt like I had to be perfect you know when you're a world champion and you have this certain level of success you think okay people are looking at me media is looking at me now I need to be perfect so every single practice Every single workout, every single fight, either was another opportunity to be absolutely perfect or an absolute loser and a failure. And somewhere in between is where you just find success. So focusing on success instead of perfection, I think a lot of people think it's a compliment to their self to say, well, I'm just a perfectionist. I, I got a perfectionist. But really, a lot of times perfection, just trying to be perfect, it's just going to lead to pain. And you just need to be successful and not try to be perfect. So I would say that to my younger self. Um, and then really just keep on keeping on. You know, I had a, a couple, I, if I would have been able to tell the guy at the very beginning, hey, you're going to go through some hardships, but trust me, in the end, this marathon is going to be worth it. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Here I am, 35 years old, now in the UFC, fighting for the UFC title, focusing on, focusing on success, not perfection, and then realizing that this, this thing is a marathon, not a sprint. And just take it every day with gratitude, and then you'll get to the top. Awesome. Well said, Michael. Caitlin, same question for you, because you've hinted at the end being closer than the beginning as well. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, like, I, you know, I started competing in, in boxing when I was like 16 years old. So I've been, even though, you know, I've been competing in combat sports for, for a long time. But um, I think one thing that I would have I wish I could have told myself is to have uh, more confidence and a little bit less respect for other people and their accomplishments. Cause I think starting off when, you know, now I've been at the top of the UFC for many years, but you know, even I'm just starting to realize now, like when I, when I train with other fighters that are just into the UFC or other girls, I'm like, who cares how many fights they have? Who cares that they fought this person or they've, you know, they've been in the UFC for this many years and it's your first fight. Like it, that, that stuff doesn't matter at the end of the day. What, what matters is what, how you perform. And if, if you're good and you know how to win, you're going to win. So I think um, in the beginning of my career, I maybe gave too much respect to, to other fighters that like, you know, were doing it longer than me. I assumed that that meant that they were better than me. And, um, you know, that's not always the case. And I think just having confidence in yourself and your training and, you know, I've always been a confident fighter, but, you know, as you get older and experience more, you kind of just, you understand like, all right, what I'm doing is working. And then you're like, I just wish I would have known that like a couple of yeah. years ago, <laughs> you know, but I guess that's where, what experience happens. You know? Yeah, exactly. That's the thing with life. There's all these things we would have changed, but that we can't, but 
you can go forward and uh, apply it. All right, Michael, back to you with a fan question. What's your most memorable fight of your career? Actually, we could make it anything. If you had a street fight in seventh grade, you know, <laughs> you could pick that one too. Tell whatever story yeah. you want. I, I was not a fighter. I had never been in a street fight um, before starting professional mixed martial arts. Um, man, I got I got to just I got to say the Dan Hooker fight, honestly. And that's not just because I'm now in the UFC and that's my only fight in the UFC. I think 12 years of being outside the UFC, I've been in some big fights, some beat some former UFC champions, knocked down drag out wars, fights of the year candidates. But the feeling that I had walking to that UFC octagon for the first time, realizing that the last 12 years had prepared me for such a time as just that moment as I was about to make my UFC debut, I had zero apprehensions, zero second guessings. I, I was right where I needed to be. The way it happened, Bruce Buffer announcing my name for the first time, the feel of the canvas, the smells in the arena, I will never, ever, ever forget it. And now it lives on the internet forever. It was warranting. It warranted me to now get a title shot, um, man. So I just I think the Dan Hooker fight, UFC 257, my last performance until I beat Charles Oliveira this weekend. Then that's gonna yeah. be my, my favorite fight of my career. Yeah, you have a pretty big one pending, but uh, yeah, you know we're gonna look back on Fight Island and be like, remember that pandemic and Fight Island happened, and you fought on Fight Island and got a huge win in your UFC debut. So yeah, Pe yeah, people that's are gonna a say, good answer. Wait, you. you yeah, you fought on an island? You'd be like, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. What like was that. this thing? Right, yeah. yeah. Caitlin, Caitlin, same question for you. Um, I guess I would say when, when I fought um, Antonio Shevchenko, that was right after I just fought Valentina. And, you know, obviously I lost the title, so I was like super, super bummed. And, you know, it, it just it sucks. You know, you work your whole career up to that moment and it didn't happen. And then – then the pandemic happened and then I took that fight on like three weeks notice and they were like, Hey, we, we need someone to fight her. Do you want to take it? And I was like, yeah, definitely. And this was like, this was like May last year. Mm -hmm. So it was like, definitely no gyms were open. I was like trying to like find someone to come to my, I just took the fight. I was just trying to find someone to come to my garage to hold mitts for me. I'm like, I don't care if I can just like, I just got to do a bunch of cardio, get in shape. And I was like, it's only, I got to make weight and we're fine. I'm like, I can do it. And it was kind of fun because, um, you know, I'm pretty OCD with my training schedule and to just kind of like take it, not knowing what to expect and then, and just do it. You know, like I had some of like, I even trained like my husband, he's a wrestling coach and I don't, before then, I didn't really train with him because I met him after I was already in the UFC. So I already had my own thing. And then a couple of my friends that from Long Island that were in the UFC before that I'm friends with but don't train with them, I ended up like because of the pandemic starting to to train with them and just getting ready in a short amount of time. And um, it was fun because it was just like no one knew what was going on. It was like such a crazy time of the pandemic. And then um, obviously getting a win back after a loss is always great. Yeah. One follow up to that, because a fan submitted a question about your fight with Valentina and you fought both the Shevchenkos. But what did you learn from fighting Valentina so that if the opportunity arises again, that you do differently? Um, I mean, I don't think I don't know if I really like learned anything. She kind of brought to the table what I expected. Um, I think just always when you go into a, a rematch, you kind of you know, you have that like nervous energies out of the system. You kind of know what to, you've already been in there. So it's kind of like, you know, an advantage for you. Um, one thing that I think that a lot of people underestimate for Valentina is they talk about how she's such a great striker, but really I think she's probably like a better grappler and um, her, her ability to get body locks and take people down. Um, every time she does it and she fights, people are always like, oh, wow, she must really be working on her jiu-jitsu. I'm like, you guys say this every single fight. Like right. she's taking she's taking girls down and finishing them on the ground a lot. So, um, you know, I just think realizing that and just having the experience of going through, you know, a, a title fight. I had never even been on a pay-per-view before. So um, just those experience and, and learning from that, it definitely would help me for the next time. Michael, uh, we hear all the time about wrestling is the base to have in mixed martial arts it's one thing for me to say it who didn't wrestle and who doesn't fight but from your perspective as a high school wrestler college wrestler and a decorated one at that what does that sport and that background have as you go into being a, a pro mma fighter the one word everything honestly you know you know and it's not just because 
you know, when you're in a, any any given day, walk into the highest level mixed martial arts gym that, that has some real pro fighters, ask them what the hardest day is, the day that they dread the most, and they'll always say wrestling day. So that's a physical, that's a physical thing. Um, and it's, and it's what wrestling brings to the table, as we've spoken about before, about my wrestling background with Charles Oliveira, thwarting BJJ and whatnot. The reason wrestling is so important isn't because I can pick guys up, put them down. I can take them down. I can defend shots. I can get the takedown at will. That physical aspect of it is not the most important part. The most important part is right here between the ears. What you learn in the confines, in the microcosm of those four walls inside a wrestling room, and you got your coaches barking at you, and you got the guy behind you who's trying to take your spot, especially in that college wrestling room. That college wrestling room, there wasn't a day go that went by that my head wasn't on the chopping block. So you talk about pressure. You talk about going to school and, com and competing at the same time, weight cuts, pushing your body to its limits. The mental, the mental toughness that you build through the sport of wrestling turns you into a competitor that is like no other. As I said, I won my first world title, beat a top, five, top three, top five guy in the world in Eddie Alvarez 18 months after leaving the Mizzou wrestling room. And it had nothing to do with my punches, kicks, knees, elbows, or, or jujitsu. I didn't even know how to wrap my hands. I just was a tough individual who had a wrestling background and I had a, a mind that was built up to be able to withstand the pressures of mixed martial arts, as well as how big the sport is and as well as the, the physical hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat nature of it. So as I always say, if you want to be successful and you want to come be a UFC champion, the best road, high school wrestling, college wrestling, don't throw your first punch until you're 22 years old like me. Uh, Get into a MMA gym somewhere, find a great team, and that wrestling background will t turn you into a world-class mixed martial artist. Yeah, I've heard that several times. Rob Font, who's got his main event coming up later this month, uh, he he discovered jujitsu when he was delivering pizzas one time. And I said, "What do you, what could you tell? What do you wish you told yourself?" The guy that discovered jujitsu, and he said, "I wish uh, I told myself to start wrestling." That's what he said because now he's this, you know, he says, "Start wrestling." It's it's the most important thing. Um, yep. All right, question for you, Caitlin, from a fan: um, How has combat sports refined and developed you into the woman that you are? And what is your advice to young girls? Um, it's kind of hard to say how, like, you know, it's developed me because I don't really ever remember my life without it. But what I do think that, like, martial arts has really helped me with uh, confidence, and I think. I just kind of notice that because I look at like, you know, growing up, like my friends and other people, other, especially girls, you know, like for fighting and stuff, like girls are so concerned all the time about their looks and everything. I'm like, it doesn't get any worse than what, what a girl looks like after, after a sparring or a wrestling session. So it's like, I'm used to that every day. And I'm just kind of, you know, just confident in like being able to like go into a room, like. I could go to a new jujitsu gym and go into a room and it's like a bunch of like big dudes and I'm like confident where I can go in and I can hold my own and, and do good or even just to go into a gym and not know anyone and, and just kind of figure it out and, and make friends and, and just get the best training you can. I think that martial arts just really helps confidence and that's something that I think, you know, it might just be my personality and that I'm confident or I think a lot of it could have been because of all the martial arts and training that and just being around so many different type of people, which I think is, um, which is really helpful for me. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you on all that. Um, fan question for Michael after you, I think this is somebody from uh, your native Missouri. After you win that gold, are you going to take a trip back here to high Ridge, Missouri for a championship meet and greet? What do you say? Hey, that's that's a great idea, man. There is no better place in the world than Jefferson County, Missouri. Uh, I was born and raised right there in St. Louis. Grew up in High Ridge, Missouri. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe we'll make that happen. You know, it, it's only fitting. I mean, this hand to hand combat journey started in Jefferson County, Missouri, at Northwest High School under Bob and Ron Wilhelm, who will be here in Houston on Saturday night. So I got my high school coaches, my re high school wrestling coaches coming to the fight. Um, so I can't wait to wrap the belt around both of their waists. They're twins. Can't tell them apart. So I'll see if it'll fit around <laughs> both of them. But um, so this, this whole journey started in High Ridge, Missouri. So it's only fitting that, that that UFC belt gets back to High Ridge, Missouri to meet the people. So we'll see if we can make that happen. 
Excellent. Well, I know that they'll probably give you your own holiday. I mean, there's going to be a Michael Chandler day and there's probably going to be a Michael Chandler Boulevard if that happens. I, man, that's a, that's a great idea too. We'll see if we can pull some strings. I'm calling, All I'm right. running for mayor of High Ridge. There we go. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. It only, it makes, it makes too much sense not to do it. All right. Final <laughs> uh, fan question. This will be for both of you. Then we'll do a little bit of a lightning round and then we'll get out of here. Uh, Caitlin, I'll start with you. Houston. Uh, can you guys get out and see Houston? Do you have plans on doing anything in the city this week? I know there's weight cuts and media obligations. What's a fight week generally like for you on the road, and what will it be this week? Um, I generally like stay inside the hotel. I'm like super boring <laughs> during fight week. I might be like, all right, I'll tell my coaches, I'm like, let's go walk get coffee, and then we go like go walk around, and then I'll be like, all right, let's go back. I'm good. But um, <laughs> I definitely for Sunday. This is cool because um. My parents and my my family and my husband, they're going to come to the fights, which is cool because the last couple of fights, they haven't been able to come. So um, me and my husband made our flight for Sunday night instead of Sunday morning just so we could get go out and get something to yeah. eat. But uh, it's uh, almost – it's basically summertime after this fight for in Long Island. So yep. we have, we're like, all right, let's get back there. We got to get on the boat, go. We only have a couple months there for that, so we're trying to take advantage of it. So as soon as – we keep saying, we're like, as soon as this fight's over, it's summertime. We're good. You're right. Yeah, well, I'm a Massachusetts native, so you got to soak up every bit of Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day weekend, right? You can't let any good weather pass you by. Michael, for you, um, man, you're going to have a jam-packed media tour, and I can't even imagine, but what are your plans this week? Yeah, really, same, same as Caitlin. I mean, honestly, I, I got outside today. I just ran around the park outside just because I wanted to get a run in, and uh, the sun was shining, so... I left, I was about a hundred yards outside the hotel and that was, that was the extent of it, yeah. but, um, no big plans. Um, no plans at all for the week. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. a lot of stuff just inside this hotel. So I'll probably go take a couple walks around the blocks just to get a little bit of sun and just feel some, some fresh air, breathe in some fresh air, but that's about it. Yeah. We don't need any positive tests either. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, so it's just, just, you guys do your thing and focus on getting those big wins. All right, so we'll do a lightning round, then we'll get you out of here. Uh, Michael, let's start with you. Favorite cheat meal? Caitlin, have favorite, yours ready. Favorite cheat meal? I got to go with True Food Pizza. Well, oh, from True Food Kitchen? Yep. Yeah, good restaurant. All right, Caitlin, it's what do you have? We're off to a great start. Um, definitely Sunday sauce. Um, I make that at home, and you know, I got the meatballs, uh, ribs, Sausage, all that, rigatoni. That's my favorite. There you go. Uh, show or movie that you're streaming right now? What are you guys watching? Caitlin, start with you. Um, I'm about to start the new season of Handmaid's Tale. I like saved, it came out, I think like two weeks ago it started, the last season. So I saved it. So I had it for, for fight week. All right. I, Michael? I'm watching, I'm watching Suits on uh amazon prime video and i'm also watching startup on crackle okay there we go um who was an athlete that inspired you growing up michael ozzy smith i was a as we said i'm a st louis native so huge st louis cardinals fan gotta go with ozzy smith all right the wizard caitlin who do you have um it's I didn't really like growing up. I didn't really watch sports or even now I don't, I mean, I watch UFC, but I don't really, I don't really watch any other sports. I'm not that into it, but uh, I would say like growing up my, I had an older brother who's four years older than me and he did karate. So I kind of always looked up to him. He went, when I started, he was like a kid black belt and he was always like the next level above me because he was a couple years older than me. So up until like college, I kind of always was like trying to achieve his level. So I guess I would I would say my brother. What's his name? Frank. Frank. Got to give a shout yeah. out to Frank. All right. Yeah. Uh, older brother, Frank. And yeah. uh, OK, we have two more. Best vacation. What was your best vacation, Caitlin? Um, I go. To, I like uh, St. Martin. Um, my friend actually owns a jujitsu gym there. So I've been there a bunch of times, a bunch of times there and, and help her teach at her, her she has a Henzo Gracie St. Martin there. And, uh, I like going there. They have really good restaurants. And when you go there, like I stay with her and stuff. So you feel like you live there. It's not just like, you know, feels a little bit not like the, different yeah, than not the, the main tourist drag and, uh, all the restaurants that everyone's at St. Yeah. Martin, you said? Yeah. All right. St. Martin, look for Caitlin down there. Michael, where do you go? Santorini, Greece. Oh, okay. There you go. 
I've I've only been there. I've only been there one time, but that was by far and away the, the most heavenly place I ever been. My wife and I went out there, and it looks fake. You're sitting there at the pool, looking at the mountains in the in the ocean or the sea, whatever it is out there, and it is absolutely breathtaking. Excellent. Last question: What would you sing at karaoke night when those kinds of nights return to us all michael what's your what's your karaoke song well first of all i shouldn't be singing anything in public <laughs> on a microphone but hey you uh, were great I, I just want to say this before we lose you you were great on the mic after you fought dan hooker i mean come on <laughs> well, now that was, that was talking and screaming and calling right. people out actually singing it's really bad uh but i would go with something fun like i would go purple rain with by prince okay purple rain High degree of difficulty there, I think, but uh, that yeah, would be a lot well, of fun. But see, but see, that's what you have to do when you sing really, really bad. You have to choose a, a, a high degree then of difficulty. Then nobody does it well. Right, right, Yeah, right. exactly, exactly. So I see it, there's, a, there's a certain play there, yeah. <laughs> hey, well played, well played. Caitlin, what yeah. about you? Yeah, I'm going to say I'm not really, I shouldn't be singing. You know, it's definitely <laughs> not, good for, not good for me or anyone else listening. Um uh, but maybe, so I'd probably go with like maybe any type of like Drake song. Cause that's probably like the only song I know all the words to. And you're not right. really like singing. Then you're not singing you're as of, much, right? Yeah. yeah. So I feel like that that's kind of a safe, safe bet for everyone. Well, this was fantastic. I want to thank you guys for, you know, nearly 40 minutes on a fight week. Um, and I, I enjoyed getting to know you. I'm good friends with Michael Chandler and Caitlin Trukagian now, so that was a lot of fun. Um, all, all the best this week, guys. Uh, you know, Enjoy the fight week and all that goes with it. And, uh, of course, good luck on Saturday night. We cannot wait to watch. And thank all the fans for their questions, and we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, all guys. Right.